evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Cadet First Class Shira Lippman. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 31st Annual National Character and Leadership Symposiums Class of 1973 Muse Family Foundation Keynote Lecture featuring Missy Franklin. Before we get to this evening's keynote, we have an incredibly special presentation on behalf of the United States Air Force Academy Class of 1974. Tonight we present the Brigadier General Malham M. Waken Character and Leadership Development Award. Please direct your attention to the screen for an overview on Brigadier General Waken and the prestigious award bestowed in his honor. We all live by the same profession, professional rules and we take care of each other uh, from the point of view of our own integrity. Brigadier General Malam M. Waken, affectionately known as Mal, joined the Air Force in 1953 and began teaching at the United States Air Force Academy in 1959. He taught at the Academy until 2016, serving our cadets, staff, and faculty as an esteemed instructor and mentor for over 50 years. During his tenure, he served as the head of the Department of Philosophy and was recognized as Emeritus Professor of Philosophy. In honor of General Waken's exemplary service and commitment to the Academy, the Center for Character and Leadership Development created the Brigadier General Malam M. Waken Award for Character and Leadership Development. The award formally recognizes current or former Academy staff, faculty members, or teams that have fostered character and leadership development consistent with our Leader of Character framework of living honorably, lifting others to their best possible self, and elevating performance to a noble and common purpose. As a promise to uphold General Waken's legacy, the Air Force Academy Class of 1974 generously endows this prestigious award. At this point, I would like to welcome the Air Force Academy's 21st Superintendent, Lieutenant General Richard M. Clark, and Director of the Center for Character and Leadership Development, Colonel Kurt A. Went on stage to present the Waken Award Medal. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the 2024 Brigadier General Malam M. Waken Award for Character and Leadership Development is from the Athletic Department, Mr. Michael R. Kozlowski, affectionately known as Coach Kaz. Coach Kaz is unable to join us tonight because he's taken the men's baseball team to Kinston, North Carolina to battle Navy in the Freedom Classic. Go Air Force, sink Navy. <laughs> Accepting the award on behalf of Coach Kozlowski is his spouse, Christina, and son, Cadet Second Class, Mick Kozlowski. Coach Kaz fully embodied the virtues of the leader of character framework of living honorably, lifting others, and elevating performance as the head coach of the men's baseball team. He expects the team to exceed his high expectations, to excel as leaders in the cadet wing, setting the example on the field and in the classroom. Coach Kaz encouraged his senior players to seek leadership positions in their squadron, where ultimately two were selected. One was chosen for group staff, and the other as director of operations for his squadron. His team also has two seniors serving as group honor chairman and one as the president of the Student Athlete Advisory Council. Coach Kaz was also handpicked by the cadet wing to mentor four cadets on honor probation, dedicating over 40 hours to development sessions. Ultimately, all cadets were returned to a good standing. Additionally, Coach Kaz volunteered to help mentor and guide the women's volleyball team, ensuring the well-being and academic success of 20 cadets on the roster. He also teaches physical education to over 300 cadets each year, educating them on the practical application of USAFA institutional outcomes, including clear communication, leadership, teamwork, and warrior ethos. Finally, Coach Kaz drove the men's baseball program to surpass all expectations for Giving Tuesday. He raised a record-setting $4,290 from 1,100 donors, 
which is 800 donors more than any other program. Thank you, General Clark, Colonel Went, Mrs. Kozlowski, and Cadet Kozlowski. Before we move on to the keynote lecture, the Academy would like to recognize and thank the United States Air Force Academy, class of 1974, for endowing the Waken Award, thereby ensuring the continued recognition of exemplary character and leadership at the Academy. It is now my privilege to transition to the 31st Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium, Class of 1973, Muse Family Foundation Keynote Lecture. Tonight's presentation is generously supported by our NCLS flagship sponsor, the United States Air Force Academy, Class of 1973, and the Muse Family Foundation, which have generously supported this keynote lecture since 2004. Please join me in recognizing Mr. John Muse of the Muse Family Foundation in attendance this evening. I would now like to introduce our remarkable keynote speaker, Olympic gold medalist, Missy Franklin. Missy Franklin is a name synonymous with excellence in competitive swimming. Since the age of five, she has been making waves in the pool, culminating in her unforgettable performance at the 2012 Olympic Games in London. She secured four gold medals and one bronze medal, including a historic victory in the 200-meter backstroke for which she broke a 40-year-old world record. Following her Olympic success, she continued to shine as she captured six gold medals at the 2013 FINA World Championships, solidifying her status as one of the greatest female swimmers of all time. Her documentary, Touch the Wall, provided an intimate look into the rigorous training and dedication required to compete at the highest level. In addition to her athletic achievements, she was recognized for her outstanding collegiate career, receiving accolades such as the 2015 Collegiate Women of the Year and two ESPY awards. Retiring from competitive swimming in 2018, she pursued her academic interests, earning a bachelor's degree in uh, psychology and education from the University of Georgia. Today, she dedicates her time to inspiring others through speaking engagements, forging meaningful brand partnerships, and engaging in philanthropic endeavors. As an advocate for mental health awareness, female empowerment, and resilience, she continues to make a positive impact on communities worldwide. Please direct your attention to the screen for a brief video highlighting our speakers' activities and accomplishments. This is Missy Franklin. This is one of the top swimmers, if not the top swimmer in the nation. I love racing. Look at Missy Franklin. Missy Franklin. Missy Franklin. Missy Franklin is one of those rare athletes that come along once every generation. Trying to make her first Olympic team. And there is Missy Franklin. Missy Franklin is a United States Olympian with an American record. Missy Franklin just so excited to be here. Here's her first individual medal going to be gold. Yes! She's going to get her second individual gold. It's going to be a world record. This has been the most incredible week, and I have never been happier. Now 20 years old, Franklin is back where her career began. In Colorado, training with renewed focus on Rio. The Olympic Games just one year away. I think that's the best thing about goals. As soon as you reach them, you're just going to set newer and higher ones. And so I'm working toward those every day. Everybody's so proud of what you've been able to do. And you did pick up a goal. I did, so I'm incredibly proud of this. You're 
such a team behind every single one of us being able to partner with brands that you know I dreamed of when I was a little kid. It's just so exciting. Missy Franklin is a six-time Olympic medalist, five of those gold. She writes about it in a new book, co-written with her parents. It's called Relentless Spirit, the Unconventional Raising of a Champion. Ladies and gentlemen, Olympic gold medalist Missy Franklin and our cadet moderator from the USAFA women's swim team, cadet second class Darian Tompkins. Thank you so much, guys. Well, Missy, I just want to start by saying thank you so much for being here today. Of course. This is cozy. Isn't this cozy? Oh, yes. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. I've looked up to you for so long, and I'm so excited to be able to dive into this conversation with you. Thank you. Can't wait. But You see? You see what she did? Yeah. <laughs> Got to start off nice. But OK, so obviously from that video, like your journey in swimming has been amazing. I remember watching you as a child and just looking up to you, like a world record holder at 17, winning four Olympic gold medals. It's amazing. So how do you think the values that you learned as an Olympic swimmer allowed you to approach your mental health advocacy and your female empowerment in your post-athletic career? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big question to start with. I think there's so much that sport has taught me, and I'm sure we'll get into it, but the transition from elite athletics into, I hate this, but the quote-unquote real world, is a very hard transition. And I knew that I had been so fortunate to do something that I was so passionate about and that I loved for so much of my life. And then that ended, that got taken away. And you're kind of left wondering what comes next. And having been involved with something I was passionate about for so long, I knew what it was like to wake up every day and live out your passion. And I knew I had to keep doing that. And so the two things that I really landed on were mental health and woman empowerment. And mental health for me is so, so crucial. And I'm very open about the struggles that I had, particularly going into and after my 2016 Olympic Games. And what a stark contrast that was to the amazing experience that the 2012 Olympics Games were for me and how much I struggled, particularly because of how much I had let my own self-worth and identity become wrapped up in my success and failure as an elite athlete and as a swimmer. And so we talk a lot about mental health and about balance, and then female empowerment is so crucial to me as well. Again, in a sport that you know is highly televised and a lot of body image and a lot of this idea of women taking up space with their strength and with their confidence and, and knowing that they deserve that place in the room and that they deserve to be heard and have a voice. And I had a sport that allowed me to do that for so many years and continues to allow me to do that, which I'm so, so grateful for. Yes. I mean, you talked about your adversity that you faced. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as cadets, like we come in here and we're very high functioning. Mm -hmm. It's a necessary part of being a cadet and how we get in. And during that, like during our careers, we face adversity and it's overwhelming at times. Like, how did you take your experiences and turn that into resiliency in your career afterwards? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So going back to Rio, I think that was one of the hardest times that I had faced. And, you know, going even further back, something that I had always tried very hard to do in my athletic career was have that sense of balance. Because my saying, what I'm known for is that a happy swimmer is a fast swimmer and interchange swimmer with whatever you want there, right? If you're happy and you're finding joy in what you're doing every single day, you're gonna excel at it. And it's gonna be easier to stay motivated and dedicated and to, show, to continue showing up because you're enjoying it and you're enjoying the process of it. 2012, no one knew who I was, so I just went out there and had the time of my life. There was no pressure, there was no expectations. 2016 was completely different. I was now a known athlete. I was coming off an Olympics where I had won four gold medals and broken world records. So now was I not only expected to make a second Olympic team, I was expected to go on and win five gold medals, six gold medals. And I'm hearing these expectations and I'm feeling this pressure as a 21 year old and it crushed me. I mean, it was truly like the weight of the world was on me and I carried that with me every single day. 
And I thought the best way to handle that was to take out all the balance in my life and completely fully dedicate and throw myself into this sport so that I knew that there was nothing left. Of course, looking back in hindsight, you learn, but I, that ended up being one of the worst things I could have ever done because I lost my sense of self-worth. I lost really who I was as a person because I would have a bad competition or a bad practice and that made me feel like a bad person. And so my mental health just severely deteriorated. And for the first time in my life, I started swimming out of fear instead of swimming out of genuine love for the sport, which even in that video, I'm sure you guys can tell, I'm a naturally very smiley person. <laughs> and I loved what I got to do. I loved it. And every time I got it behind the blocks, I would smile so big because I just couldn't believe that I got to do this. And I got to get up and have the opportunity to get better at what I love every day and do it with an American flag on my cap representing my country. I mean, there's no greater honor. And then those pressures and those expectations set in. And I got so, so scared of disappointing people. And that mental health crisis for me took a lot of time to get over. And it took a lot of working with sports psychologists and therapists and one of the most important things it taught me was the strength it takes in asking for help. And I think that that's something in our society and our culture today that asking for help can be a sign of weakness when in reality it's truly the most courageous thing that you can do. And knowing that we're not meant to walk through the hardships of this life alone. That's not how we were created. That's not how we're meant to go through them. And so asking for help and leaning on your support system during those times and knowing that they are just a season. And I think one of the biggest things I struggled with during that time was asking myself why. And I don't know if anyone here has had a situation where they've had something in their life that you have to stop and really ask that question of why is this happening? Like I truly don't understand why I'm being put through this, why I'm being tested like this, why this suffering is happening, why this sadness is happening. And I got so caught up in the why that I, I couldn't move forward from it. And eventually I realized I may not ever have an answer to that question and that's okay. The truth is that I'm getting through it and I'm gonna show myself that I'm strong enough to get through it. And what I've learned is that Part of the reason why I genuinely believe we go through those things is to then help other people go through them as well. I mean, the most we can do in this world is help each other. Exactly. But going off of that and talking about, like, early we were speaking about how after the Rio Games, you wanted to kind of reignite your career and refine your love for swimming. Um, what were the ways, you just talked about asking for help, what ways did you focus on to reignite that love and kind of bring joy back into the sport for yourself? Yeah, it, it, was, a, it was a hard job because I really didn't have any joy left after Rio. I wanted to walk away so badly and I knew I would never forgive myself if I didn't at least try. And even if I didn't have this amazing epic comeback that I wanted so badly, which I didn't have, I just wanted to leave the sport being in love with it again because I felt like I owed that to myself. And so I would take myself back to that five-year-old that fell in love with the water for the first time and taking myself back to those moments of just pure joy of pretending to be a mermaid diving for secret treasure and our coaches bringing us Krispy Kreme donuts after practice on Saturdays and all of those little moments that truly made me fall in love with not just the sport but the people that are in it as well and remember that the process is 99% of our life. The destination is the 1%. So it's great to have a destination and it's so important to have something that's pushing us and something that we can work towards, but we have to learn to enjoy the process of getting there because that's our life. Yeah. Life is a process, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> um, so in your career after swimming, you've done a ton of amazing things. And one of those things is becoming a board member for the Laureus Sport for Good Foundation. Um, so how do you see that, the intersection between valuing human conditions and the impact of sports on society? Um, obviously, sport has been a big part of your life, so you kind of are very, you're very uh, knowledgeable about how the two can interact. Um, and what are some specific instances where you've discovered this and you've seen the transformative power of sports yeah. in diverse cultures? So 
I don't know if anyone here, like no one in America has heard of Laureus, which is wild to me. Does anyone here know Laureus Sport for Good Foundation? I won't be mad at you if you don't. Okay, yeah, no <laughs> one knows, which is well. Okay, now tell me if you know who Nelson Mandela is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Nelson Mandela started Laureus Sport for Good Foundation. So obviously, Nelson Mandela, unbelievable human rights act. I mean, just, you cannot say enough. So he created this foundation, and the whole premise of it is that we're using sport for good in communities to uplift the youth in those communities and teach them valuable life skills and lessons that will carry them and break the cycle of poverty and gender inequality and, and so much more. And so we have an academy made up of the best athletes in the world, the, the Messies, the Rafael Nadells, the, I mean, everyone you can imagine. And we get to sit in a room and talk about how we can use sport to change lives of young people all over the globe. And it is so powerful. And we provide funds for these projects that take place. And I have visited so many of these projects. I got to do a trip to Sri Lanka. And I'm not sure if anyone remembers the tsunami that hit in 2004. Unbelievably deadly. The water settled at 13 feet high. And it was an unbelievable devastation to that country and to that community. And they created a foundation for good school where now the youth in that community can go and there's plenty of sports. They taught me how to play cricket, which <laughs> no one wants to see that. I did a swim lesson with all of the kids that were on the swim team there, but there's a school involved as well where they learn really important things like computer programming and the English language. And all of these youth are using both school and education and now going on and getting jobs and going out and just bettering their lives for themselves. And it's amazing the power of sport and what it can do, especially for the youth, because at the time they don't even realize it, right? Like for anyone in here who played youth sports, it was just fun, right? Like you didn't realize that you were learning about what it means to be on a team and sportsmanship and hard work and dedication. Like you're just playing baseball. Like that's, that's all it was. And so it's such a beautiful way to teach our youth. And one of the groups in particular for a specific instance that we work with is a football or a soccer program in Jharkhand, India, and it's just for young women. And the women in that village have an incredibly high percentage of child marriage because their families sell them for the dowry that they need in order to continue providing a living for themselves. So the young boys will go on to get their own education and then the young women are often sold into marriage around 12 or 13 years old. And so this school that they've created, it's a soccer program where the girls go through the soccer program and they can become coaches and earn a salary and then use that salary to pay for their own education. So when their parents come to them and tell them they can't afford to put them into school anymore, the girls can tell them that they don't have to, they can do it themselves. And it's just so powerful to see what sport can do and how it truly can change people's lives. That's amazing. Um, you're obviously a big proponent of like female strength. Yeah. Um, what do you think the most important thing is for like, females to keep in mind, like when approaching something that maybe in the past hadn't been like a popular female position, or something that females tried to pursue a lot? Yeah. Well, I think one of the most important things when it comes to female empowerment is fellow women supporting women. Like I think that when it comes to female empowerment is the number one thing, because I think there's a misconception of, of jealousy when in fact there's nothing I love more than celebrating the other women in my life doing amazing things. And I think when you surround yourself with women that are there to uplift you and men who are there to uplift you, it gives you that confidence to maybe voice and speak about things that your opinion is different or that you feel very strongly about. But I think sometimes, maybe more so often than men, we have that feeling of imposter syndrome. And that's where that confidence, not only from yourself, but from that support system comes in to know, as I said in the beginning, you have a voice, it deserves to be heard, and you deserve to be in that room. And there's so many scenarios where even today, I still have imposter syndrome where I'm like, am I really here? Like, am I really doing this? Like, is this, do they know my career? Like, is this, I don't know if they, if they have the right person for this. <laughs> And then I stop, and I'm like, no, like, take a moment, like, be proud of yourself, be proud of what you've accomplished, recognize what you have done that has gotten you to that point, 
and then keep uplifting yourself, keep uplifting others, and especially uplifting the next generation of women to come. Okay, so we're gonna take a shift in conversation here to swimming. Okay. You're like bread and butter, <laughs> mine too. Um, so kind of going into like teamwork and working together, at high level competitions, relays are often composed of swimmers that haven't really trained together before. Mm -hmm. So can you share like some challenges or experiences you had with that, with adjusting to new teammates and new dynamics? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one of the best examples, it's not a relay, which by the way are my favorite parts of our sport, but it's the example of going from Olympic trials to the Olympics. So for swimming, we have our Olympic trials at the end of June and the Olympics are end of July. So there's a four week period in between those. So Olympic trials, every athlete will tell you, is infinitely more of a pressure cooker than the actual Olympics because that is your chance to make the team. Once you've made it, you've made it, right? You're an Olympian for the rest of your life. But those Olympic trials, you get one chance. So for swimming, it's about probably a few hundred athletes that qualify for each event. They bring it down to the top 16. You swim again, they bring it down to the top eight, and then they choose the top two and that's who gets to go. It's 25 men and 25 women. If you slip on a start, if you get sick, if you breathe at the wrong point in your race, if one little thing goes wrong, you are losing your chance of making an Olympic team by hundreds of a second, and you don't get another chance for four years. So the pressure cooker that is Olympic trials is unbelievable, and not to mention the emotional roller coaster of watching your friends and teammates either make the team or not make the team, be devastated, be ecstatic. Like it is the most exhausting eight days in our entire sport. And so we go from that to being a cohesive Team USA after battling with everything we have against one another to make the team in four weeks. But we do it every time. And I think the important thing to remember is why you're doing it and what you're representing is being so much bigger than yourself. So even though we were all just fighting to put our own names on that roster to make the team, once we're there, it's no longer about Missy Franklin, it's about the United States of America. And I'm now representing my country with 50 of the best swimmers in the world, and we know that our job and our duty is to come together and be the best representative that we possibly can be of our country. And so whether that's in swimming, whether that's in the classroom, whether that's just on a relay, coming together and understanding the bigger picture and how much more important it is. That's an awesome answer. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> they think so too. <laughs> so keeping the focus on the Olympic trials, because I'm curious about this myself. Yeah. So you qualified for your first Olympic trials at 12 years old, which yeah. For anyone who knows swimming, that is <laughs> insane. But um, going back to the idea of stress and pressure, so obviously as you got older, like every, well, I guess it would be 12 and then like 16 at the next trials, how was that change in pressure? Because obviously when you were 12, you weren't as much as like a headline competitor as you were when you were 16. Yes. So how, what was it like changing your mindset from that of a 12-year-old girl to a girl who's now like in contention for like one of the most coveted spots. In yeah, it was definitely a big shift. So as you said, I, I qualified for Olympic trials when I was 12 and then I was 13 when I competed there. So this was 2008. So this was Olympic trials for the Beijing Olympics. And I was the second youngest person at Olympic trials. And I remember just being in awe, like just walking around, like thinking I was being so discreet with my little flip phone, like taking pictures of people and stalking them around the deck and trying to get signatures at the worst possible times. Like I just had no, I didn't have a clue, but I was so excited to be there. And I was in the same warm up and warm down pool as Michael Phelps and Natalie Coughlin and Ryan Lochte and all these athletes that like I literally their posters were on my wall in my bedroom back home. And now I'm like standing next to them, just absolutely geeking out and having the time of my life watching them do so well. So at that meet, I think I went three best times. I think the highest place I got was like 33rd. I was thrilled, I was so excited, but I never went in there with the intention of making the team, but I left with the intention of making the team in four years. Being there, seeing the athletes' faces when they made an Olympic team, seeing the team be called up and getting sent off to Beijing, 
I knew I wanted that more than anything and that I was willing to do anything to make that happen. And so even at 13, I looked at my parents and I said, in four years, we're gonna come back here and I want one shot. I just, all I need, just give me one shot to make an Olympic team. Like I know I didn't have a chance this time, but in four years I'm going to. And so did everything in my power to make that possible and came back four years later and made my first Olympic team at 17 in seven events. And that is so incredibly <laughs> impressive. Like also side note about trials this year too. Not a lot of people know this. Olympic trials this year, so cool. It's in Lucas Oil Stadium. They're putting three oh, pools in the bottom of <laughs> Lucas Oil. Like, it's going to be amazing. I'm so excited for it. I'm so excited, too. I'll be watching, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but, okay, so obviously, you had a lot of determination going into that, lot, well, the 2016 Olympic trials. But as you said, like, you know, you're around the people you've looked up to your entire life, like stars in the swimming world. Mm. Was that intimidating to you? Did that get into your head at all? It did a little bit. I think we talk about imposter syndrome when you're kind of standing there going like, oh my gosh, like, am I really here right now? Am I really racing against these people? But I think one thing I always have been really good at is celebrating individuality and what each person brings to the table. Like we all have these amazing strengths that we bring that are our own. And I think I knew what mine were and I knew how to utilize them. And to be honest, one of my greatest strengths still to this day was my optimism. Like I will always, no matter what, look at the glass half full. Like that is just who I am. And so even in those scenarios, I knew that in a really intense, high pressure situation, if I could retain that optimism and that joy, like that was my strength. That was my superpower in that moment. So I may not have had the same experience or the same medal count, and I may have been a rookie, but I knew that I was bringing something to the table that made me strong and that made me confident. And I think when I struggled most is when I lost that, right? And I didn't feel like I had that superpower anymore. And we talk about pressure and expectations too. And you know, London again was my first Olympics. So just having the time of my life, Obviously, I wanted to swim well there, but was able to exceed the expectations I had for myself. And then Rio was when I felt that weight, as we talked about, and felt that pressure. And I remember it wasn't something I was able to apply at the time, but it was something that Bob Bowman told me, who was Michael Phelps' coach, and I've known since I was, gosh, 13. And he looked at me and he said, you know, miss, there's, there's two ways to look at expectations. You can look at it as pressure, or you can look at it as support. And that really changed how I looked at things because instead of thinking, oh my gosh, these people are expecting me to go out and do all these things, I was able to shift that internal dialogue to, oh no, these people believe that I'm capable of achieving something like that. And that's really special to have those people believe that I am capable of doing something so cool. And so I wasn't able to apply it at the time, but throughout the last couple of years of my career, it was really something that I held on to, and I think that that really helped and resembled a lot of 13, 14, 15, 16 year old Missy that was going out there and just truly enjoying it and just wanting to make herself proud and just do her best. Yeah, I think that's, at least for me, hearing that just now, like that's a beautiful way to look at life, is life is stressful it is. and, <laughs> and you need there will always be pressure <laughs> so obviously like you learned a lot as an athlete like going through what you referred to as the pressure cooker like do you think that well equipped you for your life afterwards and would you be able to identify the most impactful lesson that's resonated with you yeah absolutely sport has taught me so much and I feel like there's still moments today I have a two and a half year old little girl her name is Caitlin and uh there's there's so many moments uh going off that, the biggest one it taught me is patience. Uh, that <laughs> is a big one, but she has changed my perspective on everything. And there's moments with her that I, I'm so proud of the mom that I am because of what swimming taught me and because of what sport has taught me. And yes, patience is part of that, but the bigger picture there is delayed gratification. And I think that that's something, especially in our culture today, is so important to address, because I feel like we live in a world where people just want the quick fix. Like, they want the results immediately, they want to see it now, and they want the easiest way to get from A to B. 
And that's just not how life works. Like, if you are fighting for something meaningful, if you want to see results that are lasting, that are permanent, that are going to make an impact, it's going to take time and it's going to take hard work. I've always loved hard work. I love working hard. To me, there's no better feeling. And so the delayed gratification was really special with my sport because sometimes it would be two, three, four years before I would see a best time. Like if, if you can imagine going to practice every day, knowing that you may not see a best time in four years, but still working just as hard that day, knowing that it was gonna be worth it when you get there. And the way that that has transferred over into er every single area of my life, knowing that putting in work today, I may not see the results tomorrow or as soon as I wanna see them, but I can be so proud and confident in the work that I'm doing and enjoying that process. And I'm gonna be so ecstatic when I do get to that point that I've been working for. So going off of like delayed gratification and finally achieving what you've been waiting for, like I'm just curious, what did it feel like, you know, being in London and breaking a world record and standing at the top of that podium hearing the national anthem, like what was that feeling after so much hard work for so many years? Gosh, it was amazing. Okay, I know, I know, okay, who's seen Mean Girls? Okay, not the new one. The new one. No, 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 no. That was not good. It was not good. Um, oh, gee. So that moment, there's a moment in this movie where at the end, she, I don't, okay, I don't want to spoil anything. There's a crown involved. And she breaks the crown. And she, like, shares the crown with the other, the other woman in the, in the group. And that's literally what I wanted to do with my medal. Like, I was standing up there, and all I could think about were all the people that got me there. Like, you're up there by yourself, so it's actually, like, a very... It's a very solid, like very big moment of solitude. And all I could think about was my mom and my dad and my coach and my teammates and literally every person that I wouldn't have even gotten close to that medal stand without. And I just so desperately wanted to start just breaking that thing and just chucking it up at them in the stands and giving it to them. And I remember when I got to share it and put it around my mom's neck for the first time and like that moment to me was more meaningful than having it put around my own neck, is those moments of we don't get to where we want to get to in life without the support system that we have around us. And so just being so thankful and grateful for that. I remember just wanting to take in every moment and not forget a thing, but I was so scared I was gonna forget the words to the national anthem on live TV. And I was so scared I was gonna hold the flag wrong. I was just so concerned about doing everything right that that's a lot of what I remember, but it, it was just an amazing moment. And then, of course, I talked about this earlier with the class I was in today. The, uh, the tweet I got from Justin Bieber was pretty great, too, <laughs> so. Yeah, 2012 me would have loved the tweet from Justin yeah, Bieber, Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so swimming often is considered an individual sport, but as you just said, like, there's a team mm -hmm. behind, like, the athlete in swimming. There's relays, but when you're focusing on that, there's still a team, like yeah. an individual event. So between that and all the various initiatives and projects you've worked on afterwards, like, what is your perspective on like, the most important thing for building a strong and inclusive team? Yeah, it's a great question. I think when you're building a strong and inclusive team, one of the most important things to remember is as a teammate, what your responsibilities are for your teammates and to continue showing up for them, even if it's not your best day. And that's what being a part of a team is all about, is it's very rare that all of you are all having your best day at the same time. When that lines up, awesome, that's great. But that's not normally how life works. So when you're a part of a team, when you're having a good day, and maybe a teammate isn't, your job is to uplift them. And if you're a teammate and you're having a tough day, and your, your teammate's having a good day, your job is to support them, despite what you're experiencing in your own life. Because if you don't feel that safety net of what teammate is and what it can truly create, you're missing out on all of the benefits of knowing that you're not alone in this and that you have people that have your back and that are there for you no matter what. And one of the toughest moments I had of being a teammate was in 2016 and I didn't qualify for the finals for the 200 backstroke, which I was the reigning Olympic gold medalist in and current world record holder, and I didn't even make finals, so I wasn't even in top eight. But my teammate, she did. Her name was Maya. And I remember 
the bus ride from the Olympic Village to the pool, knowing that I was gonna have to sit in the stands and watch this race go off. And I cried the entire bus ride there, and there was so, so much of me that just wanted to stay in the village and cry. Like, that's all that I wanted to do. But I understood I had a responsibility. My teammate was swimming in an Olympic final, and my job was to be there and to support her, regardless of what was going on in my own life and how this meet was going for me. And so I went and I held my other teammates' hand in the stands and we watched the whole race and Maya ended up winning the gold medal with an upset and kept it in the US. And I could not have been more proud of her in that moment. And I just remember thinking, again, I would have never forgiven myself if I weren't here for this. So supporting on the good and the bad days and showing up for one another no matter what. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So we only have a few minutes left, but just a quick question going off of that. Was there ever a time you like interacted with an athlete or swimmer who was not a good sportsmanship person? Um, <laughs> sportsmanship person, that, my English is great. But um, who like didn't really understand that concept and how did it affect you or the team around you? To be honest, I don't think I did because I think I kind of, another one of my favorite sayings is kill them with kindness. So if I ever met someone that like wasn't having the best vibes, oh man, I would just go over and be like, hi, I'm Missy, it's so nice to meet you. Like, how are you? What's going on? Tell me about your life and like totally psych them out. And that was always my game plan. Um, so I think either they were just like shocked and then just either went back to the finals and like getting ready for their race or they actually ended up having a conversation with me, which I loved. <laughs> but I think the, um, the peppy optimism kind of pushed a lot of the, the negative sportsmanship away. So that worked in my favor. It's a great strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Franklin and Cadet Tompkins, thank you for sharing your conversa conversation with us today. At this time, I would like to open the floor for questions. Attendees can ask questions at the microphones positioned in the audience. And I am an absolute open book, you guys. So please feel free to, to ask me anything swimming related, beyond. Yeah. OK, so the question, <laughs> the question that I have for you is you talk about empowering people and also the imposter syndrome that goes along with that. And I mean, obviously, you have something that you're really good at. And it's easy for you to acknowledge that, even if you do get hit with you know, bouts of imposter syndrome. There's an undeniable factor of skill. Yeah. Um, what do you have to say for people who feel like they don't have strength and like they don't have something that they're good at? Because I see that a lot and I don't know always how to address that because I want to empower them, I want to help them, but I just don't know how to give them yeah. that confidence. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think when it comes to that imposter syndrome and gaining that confidence, Sometimes you don't know what your strengths are, and then that makes it even harder, right? If you don't know your strengths and your confidence, then overcoming that imposter syndrome is, is so, it, it's, it takes such a long time. One of the most important things is constantly, constantly being open to growth and understanding that you may not have the experience of the other people in the room, you may not have the same level of education, but if you are willing to have open ears, open heart, open mind, and continue to grow and learn as much as you can, that in and of itself should give you enough confidence to be in that room. Because you know that you're gonna take in and learn as much as you can from the people that are around you, and that is gonna help give you confidence. And as you continue to do that, you'll continue to learn where your strengths are. I think reaching out and talking to mentors or talking to friends or family, fellow cadets that know you well, asking them what they think your strengths are. Building that confidence, if it's not coming internally, build it externally. Reach out to the people that know you well and ask them what they think makes you you and what are your superpowers. And when you hear it from other people too, that again really helps build that confidence and instill it. But I think if you work on finding out what your own strengths are for yourself, learn what other people think that your strengths are, and continue to remain open to growth and always, always be willing to learn from everyone else in the room, then you're setting yourself up to, to gain as much confidence as you can and, and have that feeling that you deserve to be there. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, hi, Missy. I'm uh, Cadet Avaru. Um, 
I just wanted to ask a question about um, like, how are you able to keep like a calm mind and keep focused on your goals during like hot, like high stress levels? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm all about controlling the controllables. So I think in life, in competition, in everything, there, there turns out to be a lot that you cannot control. And if you are so hyper fixated and focused on that, that's when the stress and the anxiety of the situation can really present itself. So for me, it was controlling what I can control. So that was sticking to a routine. That was doing the same warm up I did every day, eating the same food before I swam, wearing my lucky hair tie, having the same pre-race ritual that I always had. And that gave me so much comfort going into a situation, even if it was high stress, knowing that I was behind the block and I had done everything I possibly could to be prepared for that moment. So I think having a routine, sticking to it, and just being as prepared as possible so that when that moment arrives, you know there's nothing else you could have done to be more prepared. And then the other silly thing is everyone always asks me what my pre-race hype song is. I was always so excited to race that if I listened to like EDM, I think I would have exploded. And so I listened to Frank Sinatra before I swim. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it because people are like, you know, they kind of like do the tight zoom ins and I've got my goggles on and I'm like in my head singing Fly Me to the Moon and no one has any idea. But also having things like that that help calm you down and just make you feel a little bit more at peace. So I would recommend Frank for that. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Mrs. Franklin. Hello. I'm Wilson from the Air Force RTC Detachment 155, University of Miami. Uh, yeah. <laughs> first of all, thank you very much for gracing us with your presence and having this discussion with us. And thank you, Cadet Thompson, for dis uh, moderating this discussion with us. Thank you. So my question is, ma'am, um, you mentioned that your identity was found in swimming and being an Olympic gold medalist. However, mm -hmm. that was taken away from you. So my question is, what would you suggest that we as young developing leaders root our, di root our identities in as you become um, for like longevity in our careers as well as successful um, or like a meaningful life? Would you mm. say, would it be our careers, our families, our faith, et cetera? Absolutely, I think that's an amazing question and it's gonna be so individual, right? But you just listed incredible things. I think the most important thing there is that you are rooting your identity in multiple aspects of your life because you are so much more than a cadet. You are so much more than your rank you are so much more than an Olympic swimmer. And if you can take the time, and it does take time and energy, but to commit to those other areas of your life that are, you know are important to you, being a daughter, being a son, being a friend, being a roommate, a teammate, maybe it is your faith if that's important to you. Maybe it's a hobby that you love to do, something that brings you joy. But if you can work on finding that balance so that if and when something doesn't go the way that you're hoping it does in one of those areas of your life, you know that that's not reflective of who you are as a person, and you have these other areas that you understand that you also bring value to. And I remember struggling so much, and I, I will never forget telling my therapist this after, after Rio and saying, I don't understand what I can give this world other than going a 20406 and a 200 backstroke. And my therapist looked at me and she was like, oh honey, we've got so much work to do. <laughs> and now sitting here, having done the work, I'm so proud of myself because I'm, I'm so proud of who I am as a mom and as a wife and as a daughter and as a speaker and as an athlete. And it's because I've learned how to put the time and energy into each of those areas. And it's gonna ebb and flow. We can't put the same amount of time and energy into everything all at once, we're human but always just being cognizant of it. And so when those moments of, of trial come, we, we know and understand that our worth is in so much more than just one place. That was beautiful, thank you very much. Of course, absolutely. <laughs> Hi, Missy. Um, I'm cadet third class Emma. I just wanted to ask, um, how do you come back from maybe like a failure, maybe a bad race, or if you're just in a really bad place mentally, like how would you say you um, just find a different motive to continue on? Yeah, absolutely. So coming back from failure and 
here's the thing with me and failure. I don't think I ever learned how to fail. I think I was brought up to just not fail. And so I never learned how to do it. And looking back now, and especially as a mom, man oh man, do I want to teach my kid how to fail. Because it is going to happen. You are going to fail. And I feel like we put failure on this pedestal of like avoidance, when in reality, it is just an, a part of our lives. We are going to fail. We are not going to reach our goals. And so I would so much rather learn how to fail rather than not to fail at all. And in that journey and having learned how to fail, I think some of the biggest things for me are using those as opportunities to be the person I always said that I wanted to be in those moments. When you're winning and when things are going your way and you couldn't be happier, it's really easy to be an inspiration and to be a good sports person. When you are failing and when you are so disappointed, it is so much harder to do those things. But I believe that you can still do them. It is really powerful to be an inspiration in success. In my mind, it's even more powerful to be an inspiration in disappointment. And so those moments of failure were an opportunity for me to keep showing up as my best self, no matter how hard it was to not make excuses, to accept responsibility, and to learn as much as I possibly could from those failures and from those mistakes so that I made something out of them, so that there was a purpose in them that was going to continue making me a better person moving forward. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, no problem, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, ma'am. I'm from that third class, Kendrick. Um, first of all, I idolize you so much, and I wanted to say thank you for coming out. But also, as a leader, how do we empower those that struggle to ask for help? Mm, that's such a good question. As a leader, how do we em empower those who struggle to ask for help? I think, as a leader, continuing to just show up and be present, I think the more that they know and understand that you're not going anywhere as a leader in their life, the more willing they will be to show up and ask for help. And then I think as a leader, as we all know, being a role model of that example and asking for help yourself. And if you're being that example, if you're showing them that this is okay, not only is it okay, but again, it's that act of courage and strength, it's gonna make it so much easier for them to open up and ask for help too. Thank you, ma'am. Of course, absolutely. We have time for one more question. Oh, one more. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh, hi, ma'am. I am Cadet Third Class Rust, um, John Rust. And I know, <laughs> I know you said you relied a lot on your mother and uh, your parents and your coach uh, for practices and before and after the Olympic Games. Yeah. But what if you do not have a good coach or that strong, solid uh, support? What would what advice would you give to combat that negative aspect to the individual and possibly the team? Yeah, that's an amazing question. So what if you don't have that coach that's supportive in the way that you need? I have had that as well, and it's incredibly challenging, um, especially in situations where you know there, there may not be an opportunity to change coaches or leave that scenario. Um, I think if that is an option, that's definitely something to explore. And if it's not, I think being as open as you possibly can in communication with your coach and with your leadership. I think communication is just the foundation of any relationship, working, personal, it, it doesn't matter. Being able to communicate what your needs are, how you're feeling, what you feel like the process is, is so important. Those conversations can be really, really hard to have, but they are so imperative. And if you feel like you're not getting that support from your coach, taking it upon yourself to find it elsewhere, whether that's from a mentor, whether that's from your parents, from another leadership figure in your life, but making sure that you do feel supported and encouraged, even if it's not, unfortunately, from the coach that you're working with, but someone that you can still trust that's gonna encourage you along your journey if you're not getting it there. Perfect, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, absolutely. Missy, thank you again for your time tonight. Your experiences and perspectives speak to how we can embrace culture and empower people. On behalf of the U.S. Air Force Academy and our National Character and Leadership Symposium, please accept this token of our gratitude. The base of this gift is made from marble from our terrazzo. Oh.
This is, a found this is foundational to us because all cadets have had to run the marble strips during their freshman year. <laughs> the freshman year. We hope you will look on this and remember your <laughs> NCLS experience fondly. Oh, thank you so much. This is amazing. Thank you. Do we have to take pictures? Okay. Pictures. Where, where is it? Is there one? Oh, we're supposed to is there one? I don't think there is. Oh, wow, you're getting the standing <laughs> Oh, thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, to you too. Amazing job when you have. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you all so much. Thank you. This concludes our session. Cadets, please check in for this session with the posted QR code. Registered symposium dinner participants, please join us for the speaker social in the McComas Lounge, followed by dinner in the Arnold Hall Ballroom. Please remember to bring your badge as this will be needed to check in for dinner. Thank you all. Have a great evening and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning for the first sessions beginning at 8 a.m.